Today's first invited talk is given by Professor Wena Er. Uh, Wena Er is a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Program in Applied and Computational Mathematics at Princeton U University. Uh, he is quite influential and has made a wide range of significant contributions to many branches of applied mathematics, and including most recently theoretical foundations and applications of machine learning to scientific computing. And his work has been uh, widely received and well recognized. Uh, he received uh, many prizes, including the Von Kahn Prize, ICIM Class Prize, Kleinman Prize, Theodore Von Kahn Prize, and uh, Peter Henrici Prize from Siam. My The theme of my talk is around the following, is centered around the following. So we all know that neural network based machine learning is very, both very powerful, but at the same time, very fragile. So it's, the performance depends a lot on how you choose the parameters. So the question that naturally arises are, first of all, what's the reason behind the success and the subtlety? And secondly, how can we do better? How can we formulate better machine learning models? So I'm gonna be talking about, uh, about the work from a lot of people, but the part that I'm, that I'm involved with, our joint work with uh, the following group of distinguished young people, Chalmar, Stefan Wojtovich, and Lei Wu. They're all at Princeton right now, but Chalmar is moving to Stanford very soon. And you can find my slides on my web page. So first of all, just to set up the, the notation straight, we're gonna be focusing on the regression problem. And the, the interest is this target function F star. We are given a finite size training data for F star. And we want to learn, namely approximate F star. So this is our problem. This is the problem of, that we are focused on uh, during this talk. So just to set the straight notations, we're gonna denote the, uh, the domain of interest will be the unit cube in RD, and we denote by mu the probability distribution of the data X, which is not known. So mu is not known. So standard procedures in supervised learning, you choose the hypothesis space, which is just a set of trial functions. We usually choose neural network models, and then we choose a loss function. So for this talk, mostly the loss function will just be this empirical risk. And then we choose the optimization algorithm as well as the hyperparameters. As a matter of fact, the hyperparameters are also involved here when you choose the network structure. So typically we work with GD, gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, and, and more advanced adaptive algorithms like ADAM and, um, and so on. So our main objective is that when we choose these different components, what we really want to accomplish is to minimize this population risk which is also called generalization error. So, and in practice, we call this a test error, and then this would be the training error. So this is how the setup. What are the questions we're, we're asked? Well, so the first question is about hypothesis space, the set of functions we're working with. What kind of functions can be approximate efficiently by this particular choice of hypothesis space? What would be the generalization gap, which is the difference between the training and testing errors? So we, we kind of know that the generalization gap depends on the choice of the hypothesis space. And then how does the loss, loss function look like? So this is a variational problem. We would like to know the landscape. And, and then training, can we really optimize with our training algorithm? And does the solution that we obtain generalize well? So these are the key issues that we would be interested in. And these are the key parameters. M is the number of free parameters in the hypothesis space, the dimensionality of the hypothesis space. N is the size of the training set. T is the time, number of steps we take in the training. And D is the dimensionality. So we're typically interested in the case when D is very large and these parameters go to infinity. Our main objective in terms of mathematical analysis is to establish errors, error estimates of this type. So this will be the testing error. And the testing error is typically bounded by something like this. For, for example, so it doesn't have to be exactly like this, but typically it'll be form like this. And we would be really interested in finding, establishing estimates. Well, first of all, whether it's possible to have such an estimate, and then finding estimates for which that there's no curse of dimensionality, which means alpha, beta, and gamma are independent of the dimensionality D. So this is the key objective. So I'll, I'll talk about three separate topics. The first topic is the following. Given a class of hypothesis space, 
think about two, two layer neural network models. So let's ask what class of functions can be approximated by that, that kind of a model without cursive dimensionality. So this is looking for a function space. These are the analog of special spaces. For people who know about classical approximation theory, these kinds of questions have been answered long time ago, and the function spaces would be best of spaces, solve of spaces, you know, things like that. So here we're looking for the replacements of these function spaces. And the second question is the generation gap for these uh, spaces. For example, we want to ask for bounds on the Ranama complexity of these function spaces. So the answer to these questions have already been worked out for some, you know, in some situation. So for the random feature model, the right function space is the classical reproducing kernel Hilbert space. For two layer neural network model, the right space seem to be the, uh, the barren space, which I'll explain in a minute. For the ResNet, the deep ResNet model, the right space seem to be what we define as the flow induced function space. And for multi-layer layer networks, meaning three, four, five, but not infinite number of layers, the right function space seem to be the multi-layer space that um, Stefan Wojtovich and I defined. So why do we say that these are the right spaces? What do we mean by right spaces? So given the hypothesis space, what is really the right function space? So how do we you know, judge whether a class of functions is the right object? So in the classical approximation theory, this is provided by the direct and, and, and inverse approximation theorems, which says basically that if your function is in the right in the space, Suppose you have a function space, you know, suppose you have the right function space. If you pick a function in that space, then it can be approximated by your model to a desired accuracy, you know, rate of convergence. That's the direct approximation theorem. The inverse approximation theorem says, if you have a function that can be approximated to the right order of accuracy, that function has to be in the space. So this is the classical setting. In this current setting, where we look at high dimensionality, the, the right error estimates, the, you know, right, the convergence rate, would be something that's comparable to Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is the one area where we have studied a lot and in high dimensions. So this is the kind of estimates that we're looking for for direct approximation theorem. So the, if these both holds, then we kind of, uh, we're kind of sure that you, we have identified the right space. Here, identify the right space name is really about this norm, identify the norm. That's the one, that's first expect. Second expect, that's special machine learning, is this random complexity. The fact that we have only a finite piece of data, you know, the, 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 we can only work with the empirical risk, but we are really concerned with the population risk. So that's about estimating the Ranama complexity, that's one way to look at the generalization gap. And we would expect, we would hope, at least we would hope to have some estimates of this type. And we know that this is almost the best. If both are true and combined, we would get these kind of estimates for the population risk. So that's the sort of the scheme that we're gonna follow for these kind of models that, you know, for these models that I'll talk about here. So let's look at a particular example, two layer neural networks. So these are the test functions. These are the trial functions. These are the functions in, in the space of hypothesis space of two layer neural networks where the parameters are the AJs and WJs. And sigma is an activation function. So think of that as ReLoop. Okay. So what the question is, what, are the, what is the right function space? Well, the most important, uh, to answer that question, the most important uh, starting point is that we're going to look for functions that admit this kind of representation. So this is, seems almost trivial because this is nothing but, but the um, you know continuum form of this. This will be discrete analog of this. So this is the you know the continuum form of, of this guy. But it's actually the most important um, uh, clue to to the identification of right function space. So one important aspect of this representation is that this can be written as an expectation. So the function, the function, the functions in the space can be represented as an expectation. Okay, now you might ask what kind of functions live 
in this function space? And that's an important question. And that I'm actually, that's one question I'm not going to get into. But for whatever reason, we are going to be just focusing on functions that have this representation. The re representation is not unique. So when we define a natural norm associated with this representation, we need to take an infimum upon all such representations, such rows for which the representation is correct. So the functions for which this norm is finite are called variant functions and put in together, this is called the barren space. So I'm gonna be, try, I'm gonna try to convince you that this is the right space for the two layer neural network model. And because of, you know, because we have both the, the direct approximation theorem and the inverse approximation theorem and the Radamar complexity control. So first of all, for the direct approximation theorem, for any function in the barren space or for any function of the barren norm is finite, we have these kind of estimates. This is trivial to show because this is nothing but, uh, you know, just take a function of this type, you do a Monte Carlo sample, you would have a represent, you know, you would have, if M is a Monte Carlo sample of that representation, you would have this kind of estimates. So this is trivial, but it also shows sort of the, the, um, the essence of the matter, namely that with such representations, then we can have Monte Carlo, the, with such representations, then a function approximation problem Remember, supervised learning is about approximating functions. With this kind of representation, a, uh, a function approximation problem is turning into a Monte Carlo problem. Monte Carlo integration is something that we know how to work with in very high dimensions. So that's the direct approximation theorem. And we also have the inverse approximation theorem, which says that if you have a function f star that can be approximated by two-layer neural networks with some uniform bounds, then that function f star has to be a barren function and that and the barren norm has to be bounded by whatever constant that you, you know, you bounded the, 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 uh, the bounded these guys. So that's a, for the mathematicians, this is nothing but a compactness statement. So that's the direct and inverse approximation theorem. So next let's look at the complexity of the barren space it just so happens that one can show that this is a theorem, at least, you know, maybe goes back to earlier, but it's at least it's proved clearly in the uh, Barnes paper, 2017. Namely that if you take a bounded ball in the barren space, then the Radamar complexity is bounded by these kind of um, quantity, namely Q over square root of N. And for people in that area, you know, this is sort of the, the best you can hope for up to some logarithmic terms, which, um, which might have to be there. <clears throat> so with these two, the approximation theory and the Radamar complexity control, now we can consider regularized models. For example, regularized by the so-called path norm of the parameters. Then we can show for this regularized model, any global minimum of this regularized model the, the, the test error or the population risk is bounded by you know, these kind of a quantity, this kind of error estimates up to logarithmic terms, namely, you know, the norm square over M and the norm, barren norm over square of N. And this is almost the best you can hope for. And this is true with high probability. So this is sort of the justification for saying that barren space is the right space for uh, two layer neural networks. And you can work out the same kind of a results for the other models that I alluded to in earlier, namely for random teacher models, you have a collection of features, which depends on the, uh, who, uh, uh, the, the feature vector W uh, has a probability distribution pi, and you can do a random sample of this probability distribution con and construct this hypothesis space for the random teacher model. And with this kernel, with this uh, features, set of features and the probability distribution pi, you can define a kernel and then you can source it uh, with this kernel, the corresponding representing kernel Hilbert space. And that space is the right space for, the, for this random feature model in the sense that you can prove the you know, direct and inverse approximation theorems. You can prove the random complexity control. And for the regular, if you regularize in the same way as before, then the global minimum of the regularized model satisfy these kind of estimates up to logarithmic terms. And the same way for ResNets. You have this ResNet, ResNet is defined by it a discrete dynamical system. You have this ResNet and you look at the situation for which L is very, very large, L goes to infinity. 
and associated with this ResNet, you can define what is called flow-induced function space. That's a concept that, that we coined. And well, I'm not going to talk about the details here. You can look it, look it up in the paper. But you know, the same kind of theorems can be proved, namely direct and inverse approximation theorems, the Rademach complexity control. And if you consider the regularized model, then the, the global minimum satisfies these estimates. Now you might ask, what about these three spaces? You know, what are the errors? Com how do the errors compare between these three spaces? And then this is sort of a going from a random feature to two layer neural network to ResNet is sort of a variance reduction scheme as in Monte Carlo. Namely, the norms become smaller and smaller. And that's one way to reduce the error. For the multi layer neural networks, we have also defined what is called multi layer space. And for this multi layer space, so these are the multi layer neural networks. Um, here we're looking at the limit when the, uh, the layers have become very, very wide, but the number of layers is fixed. So for this multi-layer neural network, one can prove the inverse approximation theorem as well as the complexity control, Radamar complexity control. But the direct approximation theorem, although it can also be proved, is not, the, uh, is not what do we expect, what do we had hoped for, namely the Monte Carlo rate. So there is a deterioration as the number of layers increase. It's independent of the dimensionality, but it's sort of a, there's a little bit of a curse with respect to the, um, to the number of layers. So it's not clear that this is the best result and there might be improvement. So to summarize, what is the most important aspect of this, of this study? I think the most important aspect, as I already uh, stressed earlier, is really the function representation. So how do we represent a function? So the random feature model would represent a function at this expectation over the random feature pi. So pi is the probability distribution over w. For the barren space, we have this kind of a representation. For, for the um, flow-induced space, for ResNets, for the flow-induced space, although I didn't give the details, but it underlined the flow-induced space is this dynamical system for which you have this expectation of the right-hand side. And for multi-layer space, we have this representation. So for each model, we have a expectation, it will have a representation of functions as, uh, given by some expectation. And this is very, very important. So, what, so I, what's not known? For example, I already said for multi-layer spaces, we don't know whether approximation error is optimal. Maybe it can be improved. Maybe the multi-layer spaces can be better defined. And we don't know much about convolutional neural networks. So we don't know how symmetry can play a role. You know, how do you sort of exploit symmetry in this, uh, in this uh, kind of a line of work. And take another example, DESNETs, DENSENETs. So that's an also a popular um, model in, uh, in modern machine learning. Can we define the associate function space for DENSENETs or other models you, you would like to look at? So that's the first topic. The second topic is about training. So here we ask two questions. First is optimization. Can the training process converge to a good solution? meaning that the training error is small. How fast does that converge? Is that convergence? Is there a cost of dimensionality in time? Uh, number of iterations. So, th so that's one question. The second question is, is, does the solution we obtain from this training process generalize well? So what are the generalization error? In particular, is there such thing as implicit regularization? So before, when I talk about you know, these kind of results, I said that, if, you, if, you, if you're willing to regularize your model, then you, you have this optimal, you know, nearly optimal control of the population risk. But in practice, people don't regularize their models, right? So they, it seems that by picking the training algorithm and hyperparameters parameters in the right way, you automatically get some sort of implicit, some sort of regularization. So this is called implicit regularization. It's not always true. But when is it true? And when, if it is true, what is the mechanism that underlies this implicit regularization? So I'm going to try to address these questions. So first of all, so I'm going to discuss two different kinds of scaling. The first is mean field scaling. The second is conventional scaling. I'll discuss mean field scaling first. Mean field scaling means that we take our you know, hypothesis, uh, uh, we take our trial functions 
in this form. And what's, what's important here is this factor, one over M. Now, this is not the common practice in machine learning, in current machine learning. People don't do this. Instead, people don't have this one over, one over M factor in front of the sum. And this is not important for the uh, functional approximation or approximation theory I was talking about earlier, but it, it is important for dynamics. Now, mathematically, what's important for this mean field scaling, we call this mean field scaling, is that in this case, the, we have in a PD equivalent formulation of the GD dynamics. If you, if you, so if you look at the um, empirical risk and you look at the GD dynamics in this setting, uh, in this scaling, then you can show, this is a very little lemma, this is a, uh, actually an observation, that if you define this probability distribution, empirical distribution on the set of parameters, then this empirical distribution actually satisfies this PD-like equation, where V is the velocity potential. And this PD is really not, not really a PD because this V is an integral expression. So this is really a differential integral equation. And this differential integral equation is also the gradient flow of our empirical risk under the Wasserstein metric. So this is a very important, interesting mathematical object. Using this, this is discovered in some maintenance about a number of uh, a, a several groups of people. Now, using this, <clears throat> using this, one can prove some uh, um, delicate theorems. Now, unfortunately, I have to remark right away, unfortunately, gr gradient flow on a Wasserstein metric, if you have, want to uh, um, have a good theorem about gradient flow on the Wasserstein metric, you want your you want your uh, objective function to be displacement convex. That's an important concept in, in optimal transport theory. But ours is not in that situation. Our functional is not displacement convex. Even so, you can still prove the following result. You know, I think this is a very important result. It's proved first by Zen Bach, and this formulation here is due to uh, Wojtovich. So <clears throat> let's assume that the initial condition has a nice density. And let's assume that the initial condition is omnidirectional, meaning that it covers every direction. If you take any open cone uh, in the parameter space, it, this initial data has a finite mass, positive mass in that cone. So under these two conditions, one can show that these, two fo uh, the, these following uh, statements are equivalent, namely, <clears throat> the first statement is that the velocity potential converges to a unique limit as t goes to infinity. The second statement is that the risk goes to zero. So the important aspect of this is that if the potential goes, uh, uh, converges, then the limit must be a global minimum. So that's an important statement. Now, there are other technical conditions that, 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 that are needed for this to be true. So I'm not, not gonna be stating those conditions, which, which uh, these conditions are actually quite subtle mathematically. And secondly, the convergence of sub subsequences for this velocity potential is automatically guaranteed by compactness, by compactness results. Okay? So here, the assumption is that we don't just have a subsequence converging. Really, the whole sequence has to converge. And if it converges, then it has to converge to global minimum. So unfortunately, <clears throat> so this result has you know, a number of conditions, but I think it's important for two things. One thing is that it's about the only um, really uh, serious result we have about convergence to global minima in the nonlinear regime, in the nonlinear regime. So next time I'm gonna show some results in the linear regime. In the nonlinear regime, this is about the only serious result about global convergence to global minimum. That's one thing. A second thing is that the result does reveal an important condition, namely this second, you know, this condition that, um, that the initial condition has to be, you know, essentially have full support. We know we can cook up all kinds of uh, bad situations for which you converge, don't converge to a global minimum. But, but under this condition, that sort of, sort of a bad situation don't happen. And this is, is a very important piece of insight, both analytically and in practice. So that's what we know about uh, mean field scaling. 
But as I said before, mean field scaling is a very nice theory, but it's not what, we, what people do in practice. What people do in practice is this form of the hypothesis function. There's no one over M. And as a matter of fact, the popular initial condition people use is what is called Xavier-like initial condition, where this P, these guys are randomly chosen on the um, <clears throat> Gaussians, random Gaussian vectors, and the, uh, the coefficients A are chosen, uh, are Gaussian random variables with variance either zero or one over M. So this is the more common setup for two-layer neural networks and multi-layer neural networks in general. So now we're gonna, we're gonna discuss what do we know about this. Now, it's for this model, there is a closely related model, or a random feature model, for which we just froze the B as the initial condition in here and train only A. So that's a random feature model and the feature is selected as such. And that random feature model is very closely related to the Satulia neural network model. And with that random feature model, one can define this grand matrix. So what do, we know, what do we know about this sort of training for this conventional scaling? Well, a lot is known in the so-called highly over-parameterized regime. And this is a regime for which the, 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 the number of parameters is much, much more than the size of the data set. Uh, there are two pieces of information here. One is a piece of good news, namely we have ex exponential convergence of the training error, the empirical risk. That's, that's uh, shown by the very insightful paper by Duadel. And the second piece is the bad news, namely the solution that you select with this process is no better than the random feature model. So this was first proved by us and in San Aurora's group also had a paper at around the same time, <clears throat> similar time. And, but the, the, the piece of insight is already in this paper, which is very well known in the machine learning community, uh, the, the, um, the known as the uh, neural tangent kernel work. So these are the, this is the specific statement of the result. If the M, uh, M is bigger than this, here lambda is the smallest eigenvalue of the grand matrix, then we have exponential convergence of the empirical risk, and we also can show that the path, the GD path, is uniformly close to the GD path of the random feature model. So there's a lot of activity about this you know, neural tangent kernel in the machine learning community. But I want to say this is a disappointing result because this result tells us that there's no implicit regularization in this regime. Since if we, if we do explicit regularization, we have good generalization estimates for all baron functions. But if you only do, uh, if you don't do explicit regularization, at least in this regime, you can only have good generalization for the um, for functions in a much smaller space. So this is overall, I think, is a disappointing result. Now, <clears throat> okay, so what happens in practice? Let's look at this very simple example with a very simple test function, a single neuron test function. So we're here, we're looking at two sort of a typical example in, two, in an over-parameterized regime and under-parameterized regime. So this is, in the over-parameterized regime, you get whatever, what is, you know, you expect from the theorem, namely that the training error and the testing error all follows very closely to the result of the random feature model. So two layer neural networks and random feature models in this case are not different. As a matter of fact, if you look at the solution you get from the parameters you get from the training, they're also very much the same. So here, the blue shows the neural network result and the red shows the random feature result. You cannot see the much of the difference. But if you look at the other regime, the under-parameterized regime, so n is equal to infinity, that's the very under-parameterized, under then you will see that, you know, the neural network's result follows the random feature for a very brief, shorter period of time, and then the, the, the population risk keeps decreasing. And if you look at the solution you get, it's very different from the random feature solution. You see that the neurons can be divided into two classes. One class consists of these two distinguished neurons. So these are what do we call active neurons. And everybody else belongs to this other group of sort of background neurons, and they're not very active very much. But overall, this is a random process. You know, these guys can be popped out, can be, you know, going back to the background. So this is sort of the qualitative feature, uh, at least for this particular target function. But we found it's that qualitatively, this is true for as long as your target function 
can be accurately approximated by you know, uh, small sum term of neurons. As a matter of fact, if you look at, if you ask, how does the test error look like in the M, in the M, this is actually log M, and N phase space, then you get this picture. So you, you see that it's the, in this, the test error undergoes a rather sharp transition over here from this regime to this regime. This is the neural network-like regime. So this is the, very much like the first picture. This is very much like the second picture, namely the neural net, uh, sorry, this is a random feature-like regime, maybe I said it wrong. And this is the neural network-like neural network -like regime. And if, if you pick a specific situation, say here, this is the result of the test error for um, n equal to 100, you'll see that in the over-parameterized regime, the two, the random feature and neural network agrees well. In the under-parameterized regime, the neural network model has smaller test error. And, you know, during this transition, the path norm or the barrier norm also jumps, you know, experience a jump. So in practice, we know that we have, you know, learned from experiments that there is a sharp transition from these two uh, neural, neural network-like behavior and random feature-like behavior. Now, how, you know, it remains, this is just the numerical experiment, it remains to quantify these in the mathematical terms, and that's not done. So here, there's a lot that's not known. Uh, um, you know, the key question is whether, whether the GD and OSTD converge to below minima. And it's a very nice, clean mathematical problem for the mean field regime in a continuous setting, infinite number of neurons. This is a very nice, elegant mathematical problem. But ultimately, we're interested in finite neurons. In this case, there's no rigorous result yet. And I feel this is not so impossible. And in the conventional setting, as I was alluded to, you know, we have some sort of a qualitative understanding by numerical experiments, but we need to turn this into some uh, statements, rigorous statements. In particular, can there be, you know, uh, implicit regularization? By the way, this sort of feature here provides a, a suggestion, you know, for how can, you know, there be implicit, for the mechanism of implicit regularization, namely, there are only a very few number of active neurons. Most are uh, uh, most, um, background neurons with a very small amplitude. So in this case, the barrel norm is actually, cannot be very big. So, which turns, which translates to that the generalization gap cannot be very large. So that's implicit regulation. So my last topic is the following. So can we, so from a mathematical viewpoint, can we ask, can we look, um, ask for well-posed formulation of machine learning models. So I said machine learning models are quite subtle. For example, if you are, if you are doing a two-layer neural network and if you happen to be in this regime, then you are no better than random feature. This is bad. So how, how do you know this kind of, whether, is it possible to avoid this kind of a subtlety? You know, have, you know, have smooth uh, performance of the, uh, of the model. So can that- Wait, Yes. Uh, just a heads up that you probably have like three minutes left. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so this is the, um, so this is what we're looking for. So as I already said he, uh, earlier, the key here is the representational functions. So I'm going to just give you this hint and I'll probably um, skip the rest of the details. So let me give, you know, this is the usual Fourier representational functions. And associated with the Fourier representation, we have a discrete Fourier transform and this has cursive dimensionality. But instead of having this, if we replace the omega by a probability distribution, then this has becomes an expectation. And because of the expectation, then we can approximate by something with, without cursive dimensionality. And this something happens to be a two-layer neural network in a special case when the activation function is exponential. So this can be generalized. So we can look for, you know, have a similar representation for general activation function, and then we can write down this population risk. And the key is that this population risk has to be a nice variational problem. And with that, you know, with that, we can learn, uh, take some ideas from uh, statistical physics, view the population risk as free energy, and we can define the flows, gradient flows. There are two classes of gradient flows associated with uh, conserved or non-conserved order parameter. But in case of conserved order parameter, you have this kind of a, you know, Wasserstein-like flow. And this, if you look at this, you will actually recover uh, the mean field equations 
for the uh, conservative case, and then you have this kind of a PD, nice PD of actual integral equation for the non-conservative case. And then you discretize, that's important. You start with a continuous formulation and then you discretize. You can discretize using Monte Carlo or particle method. You can discretize using smooth Monte Carlo or smooth particle method, or you can discretize using spectral method. You can show that if you, just, if you use point particle method, you recover nothing but the usual GD dynamics for the random feature models or for the you know, two-layer neural network models. And you can see in this case, the performance is a lot more smooth. You don't have this jump. It actually is not more smooth. So that's the um, one thing we like about these models. Okay, now let me um, skip this uh, flow-like regime. This is where you, how you get a random uh, residual network-like regime. But, you know, the key question he here is that besides the two kinds of representations, the flow-like representations and the integral transform representations, can we have another representation? The representation has to be expectation. If you can find such a representation, you can get another class of machine learning models. Now, there's lots of things that I didn't cover. For example, um, um, a dam, you know, analysis of a dam, um, a dam an analysis of a dam, uh, the uh, neural network structures. But, you know, I've mostly um, uh, covered that, which I think are the key features. Now, let me say one thing about this, uh, the, these, uh, the difference between mean field and the continuous, because I left, may have given you the impression that mean field, uh, continuous rep representation recovers the mean field, which is the case, that's true. But I want to emphasize that these two are really different viewpoints. Mean field is about you know, think, taking the continuum limit of current neural network models. Continuous formulation is about asking for the sort of the first principles for machine learning. You start with some continuous formulation, which we regard as first principles of machine learning, and then we discretize. In this process, we recover um, neural network-like models, but it doesn't have to be the case. We can get other models. For example, we choose other discretization scheme, you would get other um, uh, type of machine learning models, which are not like machine learning, uh, which are not like neural networks. So this allows us to think about machine learning outside of the box of neural network models. But still, we need to work hard to get models that really, really, you know, different from, from uh, uh, neural network-like models. So here's a summary slides of what I said, but I should just stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. There are a few questions in the Q&A, and I will read them and you probably can answer. Uh, there was a question asking about the experiments shown in slide 22, show that the under parameterized regime has lower test error. And the question is that in contradiction with the double descent type of results that show that test error is lower in the over parameterized regime, and how are the models different here? It's, um, okay, this is the standard to the neural network with what's called a, a Xavier scaling, uh, the sort of Xavier-like scaling, you know, beta, say beta equal to zero. Um, it's very difficult to reproduce the, um, the um, double descent phenomena for two-layer neural networks with this kind of a, a setup. You can, but you have to really work in a rather unconventional setting. Now, here you have small error here. Another reason for having small error here is because um, that the target function is, um, is um, simple, one, one neuron. If you look at a more, more complicated target function, I have a picture here, then you'll see that, you know, this is a, a more complicated uh, target function, then you'll see that, you know, you have large error here when M is small and it goes up and then and settle down to here. But this existence of this regime is, I think it's always there. That's because here you are looking at a random feature behavior. You know, this is really the advantage of a two-layer neural network. Uh, there was a kind of related question, I guess. So I mean, on that slide, there was a phase transition phenomena regarding the parameters N and M. So the question is that, is this due to the use of implicit regularization? Is the situation the same if we add an explicit regularization term? Um, and, uh, the situation will be different. If you add a regularization, everybody will be nice. This will be, you know, this will not be there. That's already proved by the theorem that I showed earlier. Okay. Uh, and also regarding the training slide, so there was a question that in experiments showing 
uh, the neural networks and the uh, random feature nearly identical dynamics, how is the step size for the neural networks chosen? Does that matter? Well, the step size is chosen to be sufficiently small so that we don't have to think about step size. We're, we're mimicking the continuous flow in some sense. If you want to experiment with step size, that's another dimension that one has to consider. Uh, actually, that's, that's the size of a step size is also an important issue, but I don't have time to talk about that here. Okay. Uh, and the, the next question comes from uh, uh, Rakao Kass. Uh, is how representative of actual neural network training do you think these results of green and flow will be? Uh, it seems that stochastic optimizers like Adam behave very differently and can be a lot more robust. So I'm curious if there is any behavior that this approach won't be able to quantify that may make analysis of robustness too conservative. Uh, I believe this approach means the gradient dynamics uh, analysis. So meaning that if you do it Adam, it'll be uh, it'll be a lot smoother. It it, it wouldn't see, you wouldn't see sort of sharp transitions. Um, it's true that Adam helps a bit. For example, if you look at this transition here, it'll happen later if you use Adam. But qualitatively, the same situation still happens. And okay, if you look at multi layers, it, sh it could there could be different too. So there is a number of issues that's not reflected in this tool, you know, this picture here. But, um, but overall, the qualitative thing is still true, namely you have this regime and you have this regime, you know, what happens in between could be different. All right, uh, another question. Uh, so your talk focused on regression. Uh, is the story different for classification tasks? Okay, so if you look at one of my big open question is classification. So um, I didn't talk about classification at all. Um, and for a very good reason, classification is about probability distributions. And we need an entirely uh, different kind of thinking. Now we can, you know, some of the results extend to classification, obviously, but the results will not be sharp. So to obtain really the sharp result, you will have to think about this again, about, you know, develop the same kind of a language, same kind of a, uh, um, thinking for probability distributions. <laughs> we, we're, adding, we're writing a, a review article, uh, the four of us, uh, uh, based on this talk. So if you feel your, your work should be included, it should let us know. Thanks. 